good evening. Good to see everybody. Uh, good to see both of you. Uh, glad you're here. We'll go ahead and stand up. We're going to join together and sing I'll Fly Away. singing. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, that's a high uh, song, and um, this pollen has got me all messed up. Amen? Anybody else? Uh, we're going to open up our service tonight with a word of prayer, so thankful everyone is here. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Lewis, would you pray for us tonight? Amen. All right. We are uh, starting a new uh, study this evening as we have finished our How to Make a Godly uh, Decision and Godly Choice. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 1. And uh, this is uh, where I, I feel the Lord is leading us from, uh, from uh, where we were uh, tonight as we start this new study. It's going to be an overview of the book of uh, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Um, this Bible study is going to be focused primarily on, uh, on leadership. Uh, as we look at the message from the Apostle Paul to a younger preacher named Timothy, this letter can be broken down into four distinct parts. Uh, the first two verses of the letter and the last two verses of the letter being in uh, parts by themselves, uh, uh, the commencement of this letter, and then uh, at the very end, the conclusion. But in the middle, uh, the majority of the verses, uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 3, through uh, the end of chapter number 3, uh, it deals with uh, church, the church and leadership and uh, what, to, uh, what to expect and, and what's necessary in the leaders of a, uh, the church. And then um, uh, chapter 4 uh, through the end of chapter number 6, the charge for uh, Christian leadership or, or the, the kind of character that, uh, that goes along with uh, effective Christian leadership. And so... Uh, I think it's important as we uh, live in a day where, uh, where there is so much negative, there's so much uh, false uh, teaching and false uh, terrible examples that are uh, all around us and all around the younger generation. There's, uh, there's access to anything that an individual wants to look at or hear about or uh, there are all kind of uh, false truths being presented in the world in which we live. I think it's important. Uh, that, uh, that our Wednesday night crowd, the, uh, the leaders in the church, so to speak, the faithful few, uh, uh, the, uh, those that are the backbone of the church to, uh, to, to remember and to be um, reinvigorated as far as our responsibility to lead the next generation. Uh, we want to make sure that we're leaving the right kind of example and that we're leading them in, in the way that sets not only them up for success, but sets the future of this church up for success. And so uh, as we finish uh, finished our study in, in uh, Acts chapter 13, I felt the Lord, uh, the leading of the Lord to go ahead and see uh, uh, how Paul 
uh, has been called away from his role in Christian leadership there at the church at Antioch, and then making that decision uh, to see Paul's later message to the next generation of leaders in Christianity. We recognize it as we get to the end of, uh, of some of the writings of the Apostle Paul as his life's coming to an end. He recognizes that, uh, and he wants to make sure uh, that he's uh, left a positive mark on society uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, but also he has done his part in training the next generation of leaders. So uh, we're going to look at the first two verses, break those down, and then we'll, uh, um, we'll close it out for this evening. Amen. So, uh, uh, Acts, good grief. First Timothy, I wasn't even close. I wasn't even anywhere close. First Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of uh, God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's where we're going to uh, uh, close it out. Uh, that's where we're going to stop for this evening. Uh, the, the way that we write uh, a letter and uh, in the day in which we live, usually uh, you just have a greeting at the uh, top and at the bottom is where you put who it was from and, uh, and you know, uh, in love or whatever it is you want to uh, put at the bottom, giving us an understanding of who it was written from. Um, you got to remember that the letters that were written here, were, uh, uh, they're written on scrolls. And so to unroll the scroll all the way to the bottom to see who it was from and then have to roll it back up to, uh, to get to the top of things would have been a little inconvenient. So uh, Paul is going to sit uh, right at the beginning as he, as he continually does, normally does. He sits right at the beginning who this letter is being written from, who it is being written to. Uh, and kind of gives a, a, an understanding of the address or the, uh, the purpose behind it or uh, the desire of the author uh, and, and, and the person that he's writing it to. He sets all those three things up. Uh, so we'll start by looking at the author, which is revealed to us in verse number one. Uh, it is Paul, also known as Saul. We, uh, you can turn in Acts chapter number 9. Uh, we'll read over his, his conversion. But as, as we look at this man, this uh, uh, Paul, this apostle of the Lord, uh, we recognize a couple of things about him. We'll look at it in a second. Uh, Acts chapter 9, verse number 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, uh, to the synagogues, that if he found any in this way, that is, uh, following after the way of Jesus Christ, whether they be uh, men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. We recognize and understand that his, uh, the, the, the past life of, uh, of the Apostle Paul, his name uh, Saul in Acts chapter uh, number 9. We know that he was a, uh, had his hand in the, uh, uh, the martyrdom um, uh, that took place in, in chapters just before this, the stoning of Stephen, and uh, he had his uh, position amongst the uh, the Jews as one that would execute and carry out uh, judgments and his desire to stamp out Christianity as a whole. And so that's what we see happening here. He's written uh, and, and sought out letters for the purpose of being able to, uh, to take care of things kind of on the spot without having to go and uh, having a uh, go before a magistrate or a court case or anything like that, and so uh, verse number three. And as he uh, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? We'll stop there. Uh, this is the conversion experience of the Apostle Paul. Uh, Saul is, is, uh, he is uh, wreaking havoc against the church of Jesus Christ. He is yet on his way to make his, uh, make his ability or capability even stronger and so that he can do even more damage. And along the, uh, his, his route... He has an encounter with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. 
Uh, and as a result of it, he sees the bright light shining and hears the voice. Uh, and he is astonished. He falls to the ground. He cries out, uh, 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 you know, asking what's going on, what's happening, and uh, who is it? And uh, the Lord Jesus reveals himself. I'm the one that you're causing all this problem for. I'm the one that you're, uh, that you're seeking to, uh, to, to, to destroy the effectiveness of. Uh, it's Jesus Christ, the, the one that you're fighting against or battling against. And uh, immediately he recognizes the glory of God and uh, his, his heart of response. He is trembling and astonished and cries out to Jesus, Lord. And immediately after says, what will you have me to do? So we recognize just from this uh, little bit, we recognize that this man, Paul, he was a saved individual. And then we see in uh, the, uh, the rest of verse 6 all the way through verse 20, uh, we see a couple of different things. The uh, second part of verse 6 says, And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, and be, uh, uh, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him uh, by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, neither did uh, eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple in, the, in Damascus named Ananias, and, it, uh, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go to the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas uh, uh, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and he hath seen in a vision an, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, uh, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. So Ananias is literally saying, Lord, are you sure this is the right guy? But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the, gen, uh, before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great thing he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went away and entered the house and put his hand on uh, him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way... As thou uh, camest, hast sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been uh, scales. And he received sight forthwith uh, and rose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then Saul... Uh, then was Saul certain days with his disciples, which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. So we see first that he is a saved individual. We are given his Damascus Road experience, his salvation, his conversion experience. We see in uh, a multitude of these verses that he was someone who was sanctified. So, uh, sanctified means that he is being set apart by God for a specific use. He is being, uh, in his sanctification, he's calling him to a life of separation, calling him uh, to a life of service, all these different things. But he is being set apart by Almighty God to fulfill His will and His purpose. So He was saved, sanctified, and then we see that He is sent as the Lord uh, makes it clear. Look, uh, I'll tell Him what it is that He must do. Or he, tells, um, he tells Paul in verse 6, uh, It shall be told thee what you must do. Verse 16, I will show thee how great things He must suffer for my name's sake. Uh, and then 19 and 20, we see him going and him fulfilling the will of Almighty God. So he was saved, sanctified, uh, sent out. 
for the purpose of ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. It talks about to the, uh, the Jew and to the Gentile and to uh, kings and folks in authority. So that's Paul, verse 1. Uh, and then it says, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ. We see not only uh, does it give us an understanding uh, of this man, but it tells us about his ministry. He is an apostle. Apostle uh, in these days, uh, uh, he wasn't just a, a follower of Christ, but he is one that is being called to, uh, to minister as an apostle. An apostle, uh, the closest thing that we have today to this is a missionary. God is calling him. God has uh, placed in, in his life the, uh, the calling and the commission of going out and starting churches. He's going to go to Gentile and Jew and kings. Everywhere he goes, he's going to share the good news of the gospel. Everywhere he goes, he's going to take a stand for Jesus Christ. Everywhere he goes, he is going to be a vocal, uh, audible uh, voice for Almighty God and, and Jesus Christ, his Savior. And so... Uh, that's, that's the ministry that he's holding. He is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's starting churches in the name of Jesus Christ. He is going uh, and reaching people uh, with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the embodiment. That's the whole. That's the uh, defining aspect of all of the rest of the apostle Paul's life. Everywhere he goes, it's always about Jesus. Amen. What an amazing, what an amazing testimony. What an amazing willingness and dedication of life to no matter what the situation is, no matter what the circumstances are, I'm going to make much of Christ to anybody and everybody who will listen. But his ministry is not just an apostle of Jesus Christ, but he is an appointee of this position. He has been appointed by God, he says, and he's been appointed by Christ. He says it in this way because, uh, because of the Jewish influence and not everybody understanding and recognizing the, uh, the, the legitimacy behind Jesus being the, uh, the Messiah. And so uh, I have uh, been commissioned, I have been called out, I have been commanded by Jehovah God to go uh, to make much of Christ, to be an apostle, uh, starting all these churches and being a mouthpiece for the Lord in this way. Uh, but he's also an apostle being called out by Jesus Christ. And that's, that's part of the uh, uh, Acts chapter 6 that we had looked at. The Lord Jesus says, go and I'll show you later what it is that you're going to do. Uh, he tells Ananias, I'm going to show him in the different ways that he's going to serve me and, and even suffer for me. Uh, and then uh, he, he gets his, his moving, his commissioning of the Lord Jesus. That went right along, and this, this is why I feel the Lord led us from Acts chapter number 13. I'm going to read it again, even though I've read it over the last uh, 14 weeks uh, straight. Acts 13, starting in verse 1, Now there was at the church at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and, uh, and Simeon, which is called, uh, uh, that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Mannion, uh, which had uh, been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord fast and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth of the Holy Ghost, departed. This is Almighty God calling the Apostle Paul after his conversion, calling him uh, to be this apostle, to go and to teach in the name of Jesus Christ and start churches and, and, and disciple people. He was an apostle, he was an appointee, but he was also... An authority. It's amazing to me that the Lord calls him, and he was just he was with the disciples just a few days, and then directly after those few days, he immediately begins to preach. Now, 
a lot of this has to do with his background. He grew up and was sent to the best of all the schools, and he had a uh, he had a, an, an amazing grasp on what we would recognize as Old Testament. Uh, part of his upbringing. He was dedicated by his parents to this upbringing and uh, schooled by the, uh, the, the best in, uh, in all of the land concerning the, the Pentateuch and concerning Old Testament. And uh, so he had an amazing grasp and an understanding on the Old Testament, which, by the way, I know that uh, the Word of God, will, will uh, uh, the preaching of the Word, the reading of the Word, it's not going to return void, but we, we understand and know that we can have an amazing head knowledge as far as what the Bible says and not have a heart knowledge. That, that's what we see happening with the... He, he knew. He, he knew what the Old Testament said. He knew what the law of God was, what the requirements were God. He also knew that, that there was a promise uh, of a Messiah that was going to come. He knew uh, all the details concerning the, uh, the first coming of Jesus Christ. He knew all of those things. But when he was living his life and doing his thing, we see that he was living in opposition to God. So in the fact that he had authority, he had authority in Scripture because he knew it. But we see God calling him as we get to 1 Timothy. He's gone through these missionary journeys. He's He's done these amazing things under the power of the guidance of Almighty God. The Holy Spirit is with him. It talks multiple times that not only in Acts 13 was he sent of the Holy Ghost, but he was filled with the Holy Ghost, guided by the Holy Ghost, encouraged by the Holy Ghost. He was authority in Scripture because he knew what it said. He was also an authority in Scripture because he knew the one who wrote it. He knew, had first-hand personal knowledge of Almighty God, had a relationship with Him through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit speaking on the inside. He had a close personal relationship with God. And so when those things happen, when we know the Lord and when we, uh, we're open to the Holy Spirit, when we, have been, uh, when we have been saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we, have a, we gain a better grasp as, as far as what Scripture is really saying. But he was also an authority in the church as he has established these church and uh, these different churches. Uh, he has all these different converts and all of these other uh, uh, different cities. And uh, he is a man of great reputation who is uh, well respected amongst uh, the body of Christ. That's the one who is writing this letter. So we see the man, we see his ministry, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, the last four words are, which is our hope. This is revealing, as he's writing this letter to Timothy, the motivation behind all that he does. The motivation behind his willingness to serve, the motivation behind his, uh, his devotion to his calling and morality and keeping himself pure. Uh, his, uh, his willingness to persevere through trial and tribulation, his willingness to be that example and to speak truth in the life and the, and the ministry of Timothy. Because of Jesus Christ being my hope. That's, that's my motivation behind all that I do is what Paul is saying. The hope of salvation. Why do I do what I do? Because of the hope of salvation. Why is it that I continue to press? Because of the hope of salvation. Why is it that I uh, labor and why is it that I serve and why is it that I uh, uh, open myself uh, up to uh, all sorts of uh, persecution and trial? Why is it that I keep uh, allowing myself to, to be led to, uh, to heartache after heartache as the Christian life, especially for the Apostle Paul, wasn't easy? Why is it that I do what I do? Because of the hope of salvation. What is that hope of salvation he's speaking of? Well, we, uh, we first can recognize the foundation of this hope. What is the foundation of the hope of salvation? Uh, it is uh, Jesus Christ's work. His past works are the foundation of, uh, of our hope and salvation. His, uh, his past works are the foundation of the, uh, the hope that, that Paul had in salvation. 
His past works are that he is the sufficient remedy for the guilt and sin of mankind. Jesus Christ is the sufficient remedy. He is sin of God. He satisfies both the righteousness, justness, and holiness of God. Jesus Christ, our payment, uh, does that. While also satisfying the goodness, the glory, and the love of the Father. Christ does that. That's part of his past works and giving his heart or, or giving his life as a sacrifice for mankind. But we know the, uh, the work of salvation, the, the work of the hope of salvation. Christ is continually at work in this world. Christ is continually uh, at work in the hearts and lives of men. His present work is this. In my life as a child of God, foundational hope of salvation, Him working in my life as an individual, I know that He is patient. I find hope in the fact that He is patient. You know why? I'll be honest with you, I'm not perfect. And I need His patience. I need His work in my life. I need uh, the Lord to, uh, to be willing to look past my infirmity, to look past my inability, my weaknesses, and uh, to show uh, patience towards me so that I can continue to grow and mature into the, uh, the person, into the Christian, into the servant that He wants me to be. His present work is also that uh, He is purifying me. He is uh, working out or, or removing the, uh, the sin, removing the imperfections of my life. He is continually at work uh, doing in me what I can't do on my own, making me even more fit uh, for, uh, for further work and for further calling of God. Another part of His present work is He is... He is continually pardoning me, pardoning me, which goes along with his patience. And uh, because I am sinful, because I am not perfect, I'm continually having to, uh, to seek forgiveness for, uh, for thought or action. His present work also includes his provision, providing for me on a daily basis. All of this is part of the foundational hope, uh, the foundation of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, the hope of salvation, his past works being a sufficient remedy for my sin, his present works working in and through me what I can't do on my own. But it also we, we see in the foundation, of, uh, the foundation of this hope, the hope of salvation is the very person of Jesus Christ, who and what he is. He is the only begotten Son of God. That's my hope and salvation. The only begotten Son of God. He is the promised Messiah. The one that all the Jews throughout, uh, throughout the Old Testament were looking forward to uh, ever since the very first sin with Adam and Eve and the, uh, the Lord promising one day uh, I'll send one who, who will uh, crush the head of the enemy. That's uh, uh, giving us an understanding of the promise of salvation. Uh, Jesus Christ is that promise of salvation. He is the great high priest. He is the very gift of God. He is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. He is the payment for sin. So the foundation of this hope, he says, look, I've been called of God and to be an apostle in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ being our hope, the hope of salvation being my motivation in all that I do, I found the found, the, uh, the, that the foundation of this hope is in Christ. His past work, his present work, his very person, who and what he is. What's the warrant of this hope? How is it that I can have any sort of confidence in this hope? Well, I base it on his word. This is the promise, uh, the, the promises that are found in God's Word. If we will believe, if we will confess, we will be forgiven. We can experience adoption. Our names can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We can become children of God. The righteousness of Christ can cover our unrighteousness. 
A warrant of our hope is the promises found in His Word. But also this, this is the communication, the fellowship, and the instruction that's found in His Word. As He speaks to us, as we read the Word of God, as we have sweet fellowship and He ministers to our heart through the precious Word of God, as He gives us instruction, all of this is a warrant for my hope. This is the reliability and the reassurances from God's Word. So the foundation is the works of Christ. The warrant of of this hope of salvation is what thus saith the Lord. What is the very substance of this hope of salvation? The substance of uh, uh, what gives me confidence and what makes me know uh, that that I have been a recipient uh, of this uh, offer of salvation. What is the substance of of, uh, me as an individual having some hope? Well, it's threefold. It's Christ accepted. I know what the Word says. I I understand, recognize what's been provided for me. And uh, I recognize my inability and uh, Christ uh, uh, being for me what what I couldn't be on my own. Him being a willing uh, participant as a sacrifice for my sin. He came and lived and died so that I could be forgiven. I accept Him as my Savior. I have taken God at His promise. That's the substance of the hope that I have in salvation. I have taken God at His word. I don't base my salvation and the hope of my salvation on how I feel. Because how I can feel can change just like that. Right? You, you, can, you can eat something that, that, has, uh, uh, that has gone bad or spoiled and not even know it. And by the end of this night, you'll be the most miserable person in the whole county. Right? The way we feel can change. You can get a phone call from your doctor. You can get a phone call from a loved one. And you can go from being the happiest person in Kinston to be the most brokenhearted person in Kinston. The way that we feel can change and often does. So we don't base our hope of salvation. Our, the substance of the hope of salvation isn't based on how we feel. It's based on the promise given of a God who cannot lie. He says if you will believe, if you will uh, trust that that he will forgive and that uh, you can experience adoption. Christ in me, or or Christ accepted, Christ appropriated also uh, another substance of the hope. Not only have I accepted, taken God at his word, taken Christ at his promise, but, but he is working in and through my life. I can't change a person, right? I can, I, can, I can love somebody, I can encourage somebody, I can be an example to somebody, but I can't change a person no matter how badly I may want to. But Jesus Christ can. When he comes in, when he sets up residence inside uh, of an individual, when he sits on the throne of an individual's heart, when he becomes their focus, their, uh, their guide throughout life, when he becomes their, uh, their, their source of adoration... He can change that individual. The substance of of this hope of salvation is Christ being accepted, Christ being appropriated, and Christ having authority in my life for God to use me the way he sees fit. The substance of my hope is that not only have I taken God at his word, not only have I... uh, 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 taken his promises as absolute uh, as absolute truth but I have accepted his way and as a result of that he is working his will out in my life understand when there's substance of, of the hope of salvation when I have substance to my hope of salvation there is some obvious evidences of the hope of salvation Christ being in me I know that me putting my faith and hope in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ, the, the, the person, the uh, God in the flesh, that, uh, uh, that, that he is real, that it's not a myth, that it's not made up by weak individuals, uh, a weak in mind that couldn't cope with the realities of, uh, of living and what death has for it. It's not made up. It's not uh, a fairy tale. I 
There is evidence of the hope that I have and the salvation that he has promised, and that is Christ living on the inside of me. Him changing me from the inside out, Christ working in and through me, using me uh, to accomplish what I couldn't do on my own, and Christ ever going before me, fighting the battles for me. There's evidence over and over all throughout my life. There is evidence of the hope of salvation. That's his assurance. We also recognize the glory of this hope of salvation. glorious reality as we take God at his word and uh, as uh, Christ is in us, as we in the New Testament church age have received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as God is working his word and his spirit and his promises all out in our life when he is changing us, he is also giving us a multitude of securities. As long as I continue to put my faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone for my salvation, the glory is I have nothing to worry about. Because I will be a recipient of the fullness of that promise. Another glorious uh, reality of the hope of salvation, his his wonder, uh, is his uh, Christ's superiority over what everybody and everything else has to offer. Blessings. A life that's worth living. A calling into his service. You look at all the other uh, religions of the world, all the false religions of the world, they're, uh, they're, they're simply doing so that they can escape any sort of condemnation. But as we put our faith and trust in Christ, he doesn't just give us the assurance of, uh, of escaping uh, hardship and judgment, but he gives us the understanding of his willingness to use us, his willingness to bless us, his willingness to commune with us, his willingness to give us even further hope. He is far superior uh, than any other. uh, His hope is far superior than any other hope that this world or any of its systems has to offer. Security, superiority, and then the splendor. The glory of this hope of salvation uh, being the splendor. um, The eventual, the end of our hope and salvation is salvation, right? Eternal life and God's perfect heaven. We did a whole uh, series on what heaven was going to be and uh, how, what, some of the things we're going to experience and what we can expect while we're there. Uh, some of it uh, uh, we drew uh, directly from the Word of God. Some of the things we had to kind of piece together, and some of them are based on uh, on different writings and what we can see as the consistent uh, character and, and the promises of God. And, and each and every one of us ha- have have our own idea of what we're going to expect and what heaven's going to be like. And I hope it's a biblical understanding and a biblical hope that you have. But the reality is, if we have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and His Word and the promise of God's Word, if we uh, believe in Him, if we uh, make Him paramount in our life and we live for Him and we serve Him, we have the promise of heaven. No matter what our viewpoint of it is, is going to be better than what we got here. Whatever our viewpoint or whatever our idea or whatever concept we have of heaven that we've come up with on our own or uh, uh, devised from, uh, from different portions of Scripture, no matter what it is, it goes so far beyond what our minds can possibly even comprehend. The very climax of the hope of salvation is when this glorious gospel message of hope and salvation is fulfilled when we see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ face to face when we're welcomed into God's perfect heaven where we'll spend all of eternity that's the hope that he's talking about so let's let's go back over these things we see the man we see his ministry called of God to be an apostle called of Christ to be an apostle he has authority in scripture he has authority in the church so he's writing this letter to Timothy And he says, with all of that, Christ being our hope, his past work, his present work, his very person, the very warrant of our hope, substance of our hope, evidence of our hope, glory of our hope, the very climax of our hope of salvation, all being in Jesus Christ. He is our all in all. He is our driving motive and our purpose for taking the very next breath. That's the author. Then we get to verse number two. I said all that just to get to verse number two, right? 
First part of verse 2 says, Unto Timothy, my son in the faith. This is the audience, Timothy. Now we recognize Timothy, uh, or the Apostle Paul, wasn't married. Talks about that in the books of Corinthians. We also uh, recognize and understand, uh, based on that, the Scripture doesn't give us any understanding uh, of any moral failures or anything like that. Uh, The Apostle Paul, Paul before his salvation, and so it doesn't tell us that he has any biological children in life. But as far as his relationship to Timothy, he identifies him here as my son in the faith. We know the Bible teaches us that as children of God, we uh, have the commission of going into all the world, baptizing and teaching in the name Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching folks to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the world. Amen. Uh, we, We recognize that Uh, the discipleship uh, that God is calling us to. He's called us to evangelize this world with the good news of the gospel, but he's also called us to be be disciple makers, willing to invest our time and our effort into younger Christians, especially those that we had influence over in as far as their salvation. Uh, By the way, if we're not actively involved in the discipleship process, we are living a life of disobedience to God. If we're not actively involved in instilling in others, we, free will Baptists have an, have an amazing propensity to, uh, to be evangelistic minded, to, to go and to reach and to, uh, to share the good news of the gospel and lead people in the, uh, the sinner's prayer. Free will Baptist as a whole has, a, has an amazing track record of being involved in evangelism, but we have an awful testimony as far as discipleship is concerned, the follow-through. We, we see somebody that's in need, and we have a willingness to tell them their need of salvation. We lead them in a sinner's prayer. We, we tell them that they need to be in church, and we give, them a, uh, we give them a Bible and tell them they need to read it, and we see them come, and we're excited because they're excited. Uh, we get new people that come to the church and new people that are, uh, that are living for the Lord and new people that are uh, accepting different roles of responsibility and service. But the first minute that they mess up, we don't say anything. We don't go after them. We don't encourage them. We don't, uh, as a whole, I'm not, I'm not pointing my finger at anybody in our church. I'm just saying uh, as far as the, uh, the call to discipleship, We often fail and fail miserably. The Apostle Paul is doing his part and following through and being a discipler of a a young Christian. As as historians uh, uh, say that, that the Apostle Paul... Uh, when when Timothy starts going with him, we'll look at that in a few moments. That the, uh, that Timothy was probably around thirteen to fifteen years old, so he was a young person. But he recognized him as a son in the faith. We also see from different portions of Scripture that they were servants together for Christ. Then came he, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Acts chapter sixteen. Then came he. Uh, to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewish Jewess, and believed, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. He would, Paul, have to go forth with him. Here's what it's saying in Acts 16. There's this young man who, uh, who has a, a great amount of faith. The testimony is that he, he is uh, uh, serving the Lord and has faith in the Lord and, and uh, devoted himself to Christ and is uh, based on this testimony and his desire and his willingness to get out uh, and to serve the Lord on a greater level. The Bible says in verse 3 that he would go with Paul and, and for, uh, for a long period of time, Paul would disciple him and uh, lead him from just, uh, just uh, a life of salvation and a life of dedication. He would lead him to further uh, service for Almighty God. So 
they served together, going from place to place. But Timothy, in the life of the apostle Paul, was also a source of encouragement. It's encouraging to see a younger generation taking a stand for the Lord. For those of us who are Christians and been a Christian for any amount of time or in any in in any role of leadership, it is overwhelmingly encouraging to see a young person commit to something and follow through with it. He was a source of encouragement for the Apostle Paul. Philippians uh, chapter 2, starting in verse 19, Paul says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto, the, unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who, is natu- who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him that as a son with the Father... He hath served with me in the gospel. He tells the the folks there in uh, uh, Philippi uh, that uh, his desire is to send this young preacher their direction. He says, there's not a lot that I can uh, trust in. There's not a lot that I have any sort of confidence in, but you know his testimony, and I have a continual uh, walk with him. I have a continual relationship with him. He is who he says he is. He's, He's legit. He is... Uh, sincere. Uh, He is devoted to the cause of Christ. And through all of this, he says, look, my desire is that he make it to where you guys are at. That he, uh, that I have the opportunity of sending him your way because he will be an encouragement in the things of God and the service of God to you in the same way that he's been a constant source of encouragement to me. He was also someone we see in this, that, those verses, but we can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and in, uh, and in 2 Timothy chapter 1, which we'll look at later on down the road. Uh, but we can see not only is he uh, a source of encouragement, but he was someone that he trusted. 1 Corinthians four seventeen. For this cause have I sent to you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of of uh, my ways which be in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. I trust that he is going to back up to, uh, to shore up and to reinforce the things that I have taught and instilled in you. I have that kind of trust in him. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5 as the Apostle Paul is writing to, again to Timothy himself. He says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. He trusted him because of his unfeigned faith that he saw in his life, that he recognized uh, both in uh, his mother and, and grandmother. He said he uh, he is someone that he trusts completely, uh, uh, that he's a person given to faith and consumed with faith in Jesus Christ. So, the audience of this letter, we see his relationship, but we also need to recognize, and it's going to be brought out even further as we go we see his role or his responsibility. Timothy, what is it that he's doing at this time? As Paul has, uh, uh, it's probably been some 30 years since, uh, uh, since they first uh, met and, and Paul is getting older and, uh, and it's believed that, uh, that Timothy, or not 30 years, 15 years, but it's believed that at this time, Timothy is between 30 and 35 years old and he has traveled with the Apostle Paul and he's done his due diligence and he's served and he's, uh, he's been a companion too and he's been faithful all along the way. Now he is stepping into the role of leadership in the church. We recognize that he is a preacher. Now not, every, not everyone in this building has been called to preach, right? Um, but all of us have been called to proclaim Amen. 
He is also in his church, not just a preacher. He's a, a pastor or under shepherd. He is a teacher of the word of God. He is a leader amongst uh, the people that are there. He is a minister, not just preaching, not just teaching and leading, but uh, allowing his life to become molded together with uh, the lives of those that are under his uh, under his care, ministering to them in, in good times and in bad, through heartaches and through loss. He is ministering to these people. So his role, his responsibility as a leader is profound. But, but understand, as we're looking at this as a, uh, as a lesson in, in leadership, this entire book as a lesson in leadership, each and every one of us, as I mentioned at the end of the message last week, all of us have been called to leadership in some way. Amen and hallelujah. God's called each and every one of us to be ministers of the gospel, to, to lead others, to, to be willing to teach and to be a mouthpiece and a proclaimer of the good news of the gospel. He's called all of us to lead. Then we get to the very end. So we see the author, the audience, and the last part of verse 2, grace mercy and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. We'll get through this really fast, I promise. This is an acknowledgement. At the, uh, at the moment of salvation, all three of, the, all three of these, grace, mercy, and peace, all three of these wonderful attributes of Christianity were made fully available to all who believe in Jesus Christ unto salvation. Grace, mercy, and peace. The way this... Uh, the salutation is written, gives us the idea that he is asking for, calling from God, and has a desire for a continual supply or a multiplying of these three things, grace, mercy, and peace. As he's going to write these things, he's going to reveal all these things. He wants grace, mercy, and peace to be multiplied and to continue to flourish in his life, in Timothy's life. Grace is unmerited favor. It is humanity not... Uh, or it is humanity getting what we do not deserve. Favor. The promise of heaven. The indwelling of the Spirit. Access to God. Blessing after blessing after blessing. These are all uh, pictures of what grace is. But he's asking for continued grace. Multiplied grace. We don't deserve anything good from God, but God is good to us in every single way at all times. Continued grace in the life of Timothy is the idea of grace to defeat discouragement. The Christian life, when we pour our heart and soul into someone, the, the position of leadership, when we pour our hearts and our soul into someone and they stab us in the back or they walk away or they fail and fail miserably, that can be a discouraging thing. When we uh, work and put effort into something and it, and it falls apart and uh, we continually ask ourselves, could I have done more? Could I have done more? The position of leadership that God has called us into is something that can be discouraging. That's why he asked for grace. God, continue to multiply grace in his life to defeat any discouragement. Grace to discharge the duties. I couldn't do what God has called me to do on my own. I need a continual source of His grace. I don't deserve anything good, but I need Him to work His good, His blessings, His, uh, His benefits, His, His glory. I need to work those things in my life so that I can continue to be what He's called me to be because I can't do it by myself. Continued peace. Continued peace, the idea of that is peace through reconciliation to him, him continually bringing me back into his presence. I've already talked about it. I'm not perfect. Continued peace means finding peace through rest in him. Are you thankful that he is a refuge for us? That he is a, uh, a high tower. He is a place where we can go and uh, find, uh, find uh, peace and tranquility of heart, mind, and soul. Peace through rest in him. Peace uh, through reassurances from him. All the different things that he's working continually in my life, reassuring me of his calling, reassuring me uh, of his promise. And the last one is 
continued mercy. I took them out of order, and there's a reason for that. In Paul's writing to the churches and all the other letters, he usually gives the greeting containing the word grace and peace. But here we read that the word mercy is added. As a matter of fact, in the two letters he writes to Timothy and the one letter he writes to Titus, he uses this same word, grace, peace, and mercy. These are what uh, these three uh, uh, letters are what are recognized as the pastoral epistles as Paul is writing them to young preachers. These three words, Paul adds, uh, uh, he adds mercy to grace and peace. Many believe it's because of Paul's personal understanding and firsthand knowledge of what lay ahead for these two young preachers. You're going to need peace. You're going to need grace. But you're also going to need mercy. We know that mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Why is it that he says you're going to need a continual source and you're going to uh, need a continual supply of the mercy of God again because Timothy wasn't a perfect individual? Mercy in his public life. With him being an example. What kind of example is he going to give and what uh, of his, his failures and his shortcomings? He's going to need a bit of mercy when it comes to his success so that he doesn't get too big for his britches and get big in the head, right? He's going to need continual source of mercy uh, in, in, in his goal and in his aim. Am I going to bring, continually bring glory and honor to Christ and make it all about him? Or is it going to switch and morph into something where it's a little bit more about me? He's going to need mercy in his public life. He's also going to need it in his private life. He needs mercy uh, because even though uh, even, even though preachers and even those those in leadership they have committed themselves uh, to uh, to the service of God, it doesn't. They're not perfect. They're still going to make mistakes in the way that they treat or handle or uh, deal with their spouse or deal with their children and uh, in their actions and in their very genuineness. He is going to need a constant source of mercy because he is going to fail like all of us fail. Continual source of mercy in his private life. Mercy with his thoughts. Mercy concerning his areas of weakness. Mercy in the area of pride, which is a little bit of that in all of us. Mercy in the area of his effort. Mercy is us not getting what we, uh, or is not getting what we deserve. We deserve in all of these areas, failures, goal and aim, the way we treat our spouse, our children, our actions, our genuineness, our thoughts, our weakness, our pride, and our effort. Uh, If we got what we deserved in these areas, we would experience judgment in a biblical proportion, right? Right? The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, he's the source of our hope. You are a son in the faith, and I'm writing for the purpose uh, of encouraging you, and I'm asking God to bless you in all these areas because uh, as you uh, step into and fulfill this role of leadership that's needed inside the church, you're going to need a continual source of grace, a continual source of peace, and a continual source of mercy, not just because he is a preacher, but because he is a child of God who is accepting the responsibility of leadership. If you're going to lead, be an example to the next generation, if you're going to be what God has called you to be, you're going to need a continual source of grace, mercy, and peace, and those only come through Jesus Christ, who is also our hope for all these things.